All right, welcome everybody um, in our TUM AI lecture series. It's a pleasure to have Gordon Wetschlan here. Uh, Gordon is an associate professor um, of electrical engineering at Stanford University, also by courtesy of computer science. Um, he's leading the Stanford Computational Imaging Lab, um, and he's also a co-director of the Stanford Center for Image Systems and Engineering. So I've actually had the pleasure um, to work um, with Gordon for quite a while, and I have to say it's really an amazing experience. I've learned really a lot um, how to work on, on really impactful papers. Um, Gordon's work is, is renowned across many communities, from like the SIGGRAPH community to actually nowadays the NURBS communities and machine learning with a lot of these null representations that came out from his lab. Um, also, many of his own students have now become professors and have um, they'll have their own labs right now. Um, and as a side, <laughs> Gordon is also a co-founder of several startups, which are also doing pretty well, as uh, what I've heard. Um, so all to say, um, Gordon is um, a pioneer in, in computational imaging. He has done a lot of awesome work, and it's a real pleasure to have him here today um, talking about neural scene representations. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Matthias. Uh, it, it's been great uh, to work with you in the past, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today. A fantastic lecture series. I recommend to all my students uh, to watch all of these lectures. So it's a really great resource to have, and I'm, I'm honored to be part of that. What I'd like to talk about today is uh, some of our recent work on neural scene representation, rendering, and generation. Uh, and uh, you've probably seen a few talks in the series already that cover some of these aspects. So I, I won't spend too much time on the representation and rendering part, because it's something that many of you will be familiar with to some extent. I'll just add a few uh, aspects of our own work. And then I'll, I'll focus on the generation part, because I believe that that's really a, a new direction of this field that brings together computer vision, AI, and computer graphics in novel ways that, that really enables new ways of thinking about content creation, manipulation, and generation. And on the left, these little video clips that you can hopefully see playing are, are a few examples of our upcoming CVPR 2020 paper on that we call EG3D, Efficient uh, Generative uh, 3D Adversarial Networks. And, and these are all synthetically generated people. Uh, that the, the GAN with a 3D GAN, the GAN is trained only on 2D unstructured data. So there's no multi-view data, no 3D supervision or anything. Uh, and uh, you can uh, then uh, generate new people, you can interpolate between them. And it's, uh, it's really interesting things that, that, that these new times of uh, 3D uh, GANs can enable. Uh, and, but all of this builds on, on some of these emerging scene representations and rendering. So let me start with that. Many of you will probably be familiar with NERF, Neural Radiance Fields. Uh, it's, it's an area that kicked off a uh, new direction in computer vision and AI about two years ago now. And the idea there was to uh, take a series of 2D photographs of a single scene, um, distill a neural network parameterized representation that we call the neural radiance field, basically, from these photographs. And then we're able to interpolate uh, these images. And uh, we can do that in a photorealistic way. I think that's really what, what the breakthrough was, is that we, we get this quality that's pretty much indistinguishable from uh, photographs or video content. And that back then worked really well for a dense set of images. Uh, the interesting part is that the scene representation and rendering together are actually physically inspired as well. So without direct supervision of any 3D point clouds or depth uh, maps, you actually get a very good depth map out of this as well, which you can see on the lower right. So all of these are part of the reasons why NERF has really kicked off and, and taken over many different fields uh, and sort of replaced and augmented more existing uh, conventional computer vision techniques. Uh, we've seen a lot of follow-up work on NERF. Uh, I don't want to highlight too many of them, but uh, one that I found interesting is like, I mean, we can do this for 360 degree scenes now. And uh, it, it's not quite photorealistic there yet, but you really have to find and look for the small artifacts that are remaining. And overall, it's it's getting fairly good, even from very sparse sets of images. So, you know, computer vision, especially 3D computer vision has made a tremendous strides over the last just two years. And probably between the time I prepared this talk and now uh, many archive papers have popped up that, that I've missed already. So it's a really active field and many of you will be interested in this. Uh, and, and I'm just gonna summarize this entire field as neural scene representation, rendering and generation. Uh, it has applications in many different areas, uh, ranging from 3D computer vision, uh, 
where we take maybe images and try to distill some underlying representation of the scene that we can then re-render or infer properties about. Computer graphics, this is closely related to image-based rendering where instead of you know, directly modeling the primitives and then rendering them, we, we want to model those from, from images instead. Uh, but it's also very useful in robotics, for example, when you think about you know, path planning or doing other tasks, grasping, you know, having a differentiable representation of the scene is not only good for inferring visual properties and uh, interpolating them or extrapolating them, but it can also help you classify things in the scene or make uh, ro more robust decisions. And that, that's obviously interesting for autonomous driving as well. You can use these types of representations potentially for sensor fusion, perhaps when you have LIDARs, radars, and other types of visual sensors, uh, even multimodal sensors. A neural representation is nothing other than a differentiable representation of the entire scene with all its modalities that is somehow inferred. And we'll talk about this more. Uh, the elephant in the room is probably what people now refer to as the metaverse, is we want to populate the metaverse with you know, artificial content and maybe generate infinite uh, infinite content as you, as you walk ar around. So we really need to think about photorealistic content, how to populate that metaverse, and, and maybe also how to generate new content uh, on the fly. And this is where these generation techniques, I think, can, can be very useful as well. Okay, let me talk about uh, neural scene representation first, because uh, the representation typically is the first thing we need, we need to think about. So when we think about a representation or how to represent signals in general, it's really not just limited to 3D scenes. Uh, when we think about representing 2D images, 3D shapes, maybe 1D audio signals even, there, there are many different ways we could do that, but there's really one prevailing technique today and uh, that's discrete representation, uh, representations where we store images as 2D arrays of pixels, uh, basically each pixel having a grayscale value or, or three color values. Uh, 3D shapes, uh, I mean, there are many different shape representations, but uh, perhaps we could represent them using 3D point clouds, audio, sam audio is sampled at a specific sampling rate, and then you store this as uh, maybe a stereo channel or something like that. So, you know, these discrete representations are uh, prevailing, uh, basically signal processing in, in all applications today, and for good reason, because they're very robust and they have many benefits. But over the last few years, we've seen an alternative coming along, and that is basically using neural networks to represent scenes in a continuous way. And I, I just want to emphasize this line of work because it kind of predates uh, NERF also. <clears throat> but for me, this is really the starting point of this neural scene representation line of work is the, the work by JJ Park and Meshadar from Andreas Geiger's group. Is The idea back there was to take a neural network, in particular a multi-layer perceptron, to represent a 3D shape. Uh, and they were able to do that in a continuous way. And they were able to do this uh, by basically taking this MLP and defining it in a fairly simple way that turns out to be very powerful. So the way this is done is that you feed in the coordinate, so the XYZ coordinate of an object or world space into this uh, MLP. And the MLP will basically learn to uh, map these coordinates to a quantity of interest. For example, uh, the occupancy of the, of the uh, 3D space or perhaps the uh, sign distance to the closest surface. So these are occupancy fields or sign distance functions. And the basic idea is that we, we use this universal function approximation theorem to say we gonna, we're gonna use this network and we're gonna approximate the function that represents the 3D shape. The benefit of that is that, I mean, it's continuous. We can query it anywhere in space. And uh, uh, as I'll show you later, uh, there, there are many other benefits because we can start generalizing uh, across different objects or across different scenes because we have this functional representation or, instead of just being able to represent a single object. We can now learn something about a distribution of functions. So there are many, many interesting applications for this functional representation. And the way it was introduced back in 2018 was that these uh, MLPs used the single most popular uh, uh, architecture, which includes the uh, rectified linear unit as a, as a, a nonlinear activation function as part of your network. And that worked reasonably well for individual objects like this bunny that you can see here. But as soon as you start going to more complicated scenes uh, you know, that, that include many different objects and that are not maybe uh, 
you know, aligned with the global world coordinate system, then you're going to start getting into uh, trouble and you're hitting the limits, the capacity limits of the network itself. So in this case, I'll show you, uh, I'm showing you an example of a 3D point cloud of, of a room and an MLP fit to this room on the bottom. And as you can see, uh, there are a lot of artifacts in there actually. And they boil back down to the fact that the network itself doesn't have enough capacity to really uh, represent the scene. Now, you could always make the network larger, uh, maybe deeper, maybe wider, maybe both, uh, and study that. But uh, our goal for these representations is actually to keep them as compact as possible, as expressive as possible. And these ReLU architectures that are really great for CNNs and other architectures just turn out not to be ideal for these specific coordinate network representations. Uh, this is not only true for 3D shapes, but if you try to represent a 2D image, a 1D audio signal, or maybe even a wave field that you could use in, in physics-based setting uh, and try to run some simulations on, let's say like a, like a fluid, and you want to run some Navier-Stokes uh, equations on and to simulate them or, or some other wave, it, it just turns out that the, this limited capacity is really a major bottleneck. So concurrently to the NERF paper, which introduced a positional encoding approach to the ReLU MLPs, uh, my group actually worked on uh, exploring other nonlinear activation functions, in particular periodic activation functions. Uh, we call this SIREN for sinusoidal representation networks. Uh, and the basic idea was very simple, replace the uh, ReLU activation functions with signs. So now it seems like a small change, but it turns out that with a very compact network uh, architecture, you can have now a very high amount of capacity you know, as Geoff Hinton put it, you basically, in theory, have unlimited capacity. Uh, and that, in practice, works out really well because now you can take these natural images, you can really fit them to arbitrarily high precision, uh, 3D shapes of complex scenes, uh, that works as well. Uh, audio samples, uh, you can represent your audio samples using a small neural network. Uh, similarly, we demonstrated in this uh, Siren paper also that, uh, again, you can, you can fit a field uh, to it and you know, typically when you use these in differential equations or in physics-based settings, you need to have access to the gradients. But the nice thing about a network is that they are differentiable. I mean, that's where we use autodiff uh, to, to differentiate them with respect to their parameters. And we can do the same thing to get the gradient of a field or some other representation directly by using autodiff. And we can use that to solve partial differential equations uh, to solve physics-based problems. So this is really interesting. And, and uh, ReLU, by the way, is not really differentiable, right? So you couldn't really use the, the, them in these settings. So it was just a really interesting time to think about uh, what types of neural network architectures you may want to use for uh, representing 3D scenes. Here we ran some tests on fitting fairly complicated objects. In this case, we use a five-layer MLP with 256 hidden units. So it's not, it's not super, super small, but it's also not very large, actually. And as you can see in this side-by-side -side comparison, a ReLU activation function on the left gives you these very coarse approximations of these shapes, whereas the periodic activation functions with the exact same network architecture actually give you a lot of details. And when you start thinking about you know, what a ReLU really does intuitively, it basically carves up the space into hyperplanes. Uh, and so it, it has this piecewise planar uh, representation of the scene which just turns out to be a poor approximation for most object types that have a lot of details. Uh, this worked also well for larger scale scenes. As you can see here on the left is the ReLU based representation with the same network as on the right with the siren. Okay, you get all these details. Just get a lot more capacity for the same architecture, for the same memory footprint, for the same computational burden of querying the network. And that really kicked off a, a new direction for us to think about, you know, in, in these contexts where we want to use neural networks to represent different types of scenes, you know, what is the best architecture? And based on the literature today, there, there are basically three different choices. Um, I'm just going to categorize them into the following categories. I'm going to use the implicit representations on the left. This is basically what uh, nerf like representations are. For 3D shapes, they would just take the 3D position as input and output some quantity of interest like the SDF value or the occupancy. Uh, for NERF, it actually took in the 3D position and also the viewing direction. So it's a five-dimensional input. 
and then it uh, outputs the density and the color. So the, you know, there's some discussion on whether implicit is the right terminology here. Uh, I, I like to use the phrase because the network implicitly defines a shape or the network implicitly defines a, um, a radiance field, but the network itself isn't, you know, what, what, what does it mean to be implicit, but it implicitly defines something. So I'm just gonna use this, term, this terminology sim uh, synonymously. So again, this is what NERV and SIREN are. Uh, these network architectures can be memory efficient. They don't have to be actually. So in practice, it sometimes turns out that they're actually fairly large networks and don't give you that many memory benefits. But if you think about a learning a 5D function, a 5D lookup table, like a radiance field, right? A radiance field would be defined by, for all 3D positions and the, the 2D viewing directions, that's a 5D lookup table. If you want to store that in a discrete grid, you're going to quickly run out of memory if you want to do that at uh, reasonably high resolutions. Uh, the, the challenge really with these implicit networks is that they're fairly slow. Uh, even a five layer network takes some time to query. And when you combine this with neural rendering, as we'll discuss in the following, it, it, it's going to be very, very slow. Uh, so it's not always the best choice. The obvious uh, alternative is to use an explicit representation. An explicit representation basically means that you have you bake in the 3D structure uh, into the into the you know architecture, and you basically, for example, for a 3D scene, you use a 3D voxel grid, uh, and every at every position you store a feature. Um, so it's a fairly simple uh, type of architecture where you have a, an n cubed uh, array of features, and you can at every position query it and use your favorite interpolation technique to uh, also continuously quer query it. Right, so this is very fast because you just need to do a lookup and, and a bilinear interpolation, for example, but it gets memory inefficient fairly quickly as you scale to higher resolutions or higher dimensions. For example, a 5D lookup table to, to store that at a reasonably high resolution is going to be difficult. Examples of this include deep voxels. It was actually a collaboration between Matthias' group and, uh, and my group back, back a few years ago, uh, but there's also been other work in this space. I'd say it's sometimes the best uh, solution is kind of in the middle between the two. And I'll refer to those as hybrid representations. Uh, I'll get back to that uh, later on, but I, I wanna talk a little bit about it now. A hybrid representation tries to you know, be memory efficient and computationally efficient by giving you the best of both worlds. And there are a number of different examples. For example, deep local shapes basically broke up uh, the 3D space into small uh, volume cubes of volume, and then represented instead of entire scenes in each in each little voxel, just an object part. So then you can you know compose the entire scene out of small object parts that are each small MLPs. There are many many examples of this. The most recent one is maybe the instant uh, neural graphics primitives paper from NVIDIA, which basically showed how to train nerve in real time using these types of architectures. What makes it fast is that. Uh, your implicit part is basically the interpolation uh, part. So instead of just using trilinear interpolation, you're gonna take these features and send them through a very small MLP, maybe two layers or something like that, a very, very fast and efficient uh, MLP-based decoder, uh, but you store most of the features uh, in this grid. So let me talk about this a little bit more. Uh, I, I told you that there are a number of different examples of, uh, of these types of hybrid representations. Uh, we worked on one also last year. We called it uh, ACORN, Adaptive Coordinate Networks. And the idea was actually fairly simple. I'm just going to use uh, the example of uh, fitting a 16 megapixel image uh, of Mars. Or is this Mars? No, it's a different planet. Sorry, I'm blanking on which one it is. Uh, but the, the basic idea is that instead of subdividing the space in a uniform way, I mean, it, it seems intuitive that we uh, subdivide it in an adaptive way. So uh, empty space, you don't need a lot of information to represent that, so you could use a very coarse grid. Uh, in some parts, you may have more details and you want to have a finer grid there. It, it's very intuitive, uh, very inspired by traditional computer graphics techniques such as quad trees or oak trees. And there has been some work uh, on you know, taking a pre-trained radiance field and breaking that up into some adaptive grid, but that's really not the point because we'd like to train the representation itself in a way that allows us to learn this adaptive grid on the fly, rather than first having to fit, uh, fit the, the entire signal at, at the finest resolution and then compressing it later. And the benefit of that is that you can just train on much larger scale data, right? And uh, our ACORN method was able to do that. 
uh, here you can see this example of uh, oh Pluto, it's Pluto. <laughs> yeah, uh, we're fitting Pluto on the left with Siren, on the right with Acorn. Uh, this is a real time uh, uh, visualization of the training procedure, and as you can see, within 30 seconds, you get up to 30 dB with Acorn on the right, and you can see the learned decomposition on the on the lower right. So this is really a remarkable uh, performance. I mean, nowadays we have instant NGB uh, that can fit uh, scenes in a few seconds. So there's been a lot of progress in this general space, but uh, it was interesting to see uh, how to speed up the training part. Sirens, actually, if you don't run them long enough, they can fit the signal perfectly, uh, just like Acorn can. Uh, but it just takes a long time sometimes to fit a large scale signal and you, you just have to wait. Okay, uh, we can do the same thing with 3D shapes. Uh, here you can see a couple of different uh, comparisons between the ground truth 3D shape convolutional occupancy networks, also a very influential paper, uh, Sirens and, and Acorn. So it's actually hard to beat uh, Siren if you don't have a time limit. If you just train it for long enough, you get a lot of detail out of that. It's not really limited by the capacity again but it's limited by the training speed. So these are all 3D shapes represented as sign distance functions. And you get a lot, a lot of detail in, in the acorn in a limited amount of time. We just had to stop it after something like 24 hours or so. Okay. So just a couple of thoughts on neural scene representation, the representation part. These neural scene representations are really useful. In many different applications, we've seen a lot of uh, applications in view interpolation and extrapolation. That's the type of nerve application. But you can also start thinking about compression uh, and generalization. That, that Those are really the most powerful concepts. Uh, what you really need this representation to be is it, it needs to be fast to query. So it needs to be small. You need to get a lot of capacity for a small architecture. Because when they're too slow, then it's not all that useful for more complicated scenes. They need to be expressive and have a lot of capacity, and they need to be memory efficient at the same time. So uh, I would say these are the most important uh, properties. If we want to get the most utility out of them for some applications, like in computer vision and, and computer graphics, uh, we don't always have 3D content to supervise them, like a point cloud. Sometimes we just have photographs. Uh, so what we need to think about is how to put a a differentiable rendering system on top of them so that we can supervise the 3D representation directly from 2D data. And that's what I'd like to talk next. But uh, before we part, again, I just want to drive home this, uh, this message that neural scene representations are differentiable representations of a scene. And one of the most useful functions, uh, things you can do with them is to learn something about a distribution of functions. So rather than just overfitting them, to a single scene, we'd like to really use it to learn something about a distribution of functions, of scenes, of objects, for example, faces, bodies, and other types of objects. So this is where I think the, the real power of these neural representations comes in. And that's the last part of the talk. But let's talk about the rendering just for a few minutes. Rendering is not all that complicated. Uh, you know, people in computer graphics have been working on rendering for decades now, and they've developed all sorts of rendering techniques. Um, for neural rendering, it really depends on what, rep what you're trying to represent. For example, uh, if you are representing a sign distance function uh, with your neural network, then the natural rendering algorithm for that is sphere tracing, for example. There's a well-known technique published in 1996, and there were a number of papers that adopted this in a differentiable way uh, on top of a neural network parameterized sign distance function. Uh, if you use a volume representation, such as NORF, for example, then a volume rendering is the natural way to go. And Nelson Max published that paper in 1995. So on the rendering side, at least at, at the first order approximation, there isn't all that much magic, is you just need to think about what you're trying to represent, which intermediate quantities with your representation, and then design the rendering method on top of that. So I'm not gonna to spend too much more time on, on, uh, on the rendering part, and I'll just refer you to the state-of-the-art report from uh, Ayush Tivari and Matthias is on it as well, and a number of other people. Uh, we wrote the first version in 2020 and then an updated version uh, just late last year. Uh, I think the final version is coming out just, just in a few weeks from now. So these are really great overviews of both the traditional rendering techniques that are now being adopted into neural rendering. Uh, just to highlight some of our work in this general space, uh, 
we have worked on both science distance functions and sphere tracing, uh, also volume rendering. So just uh, really briefly, uh, one paper that comes to mind from last year that we called neural lumigraph rendering was really tackling this uh, sphere tracing problem. It, sphere tracing is, is a well understood algorithm and people have been using it a few times. Um, there are a lot of benefits to actually being able to sphere trace a surface directly. Um, and uh, uh, the, the primary benefit is that you get a shape out at the end, right? So even if, if you have a spark set of views, uh, you infer a scene representation that represents a science distance function. You can actually use marching cubes or other algorithms to extract that neural surface, discretize it again, and then use it in your traditional graphics pipeline uh, to render it in real time. So real-time rendering almost comes for free once you've inferred the, the representation. And that's something that we were able to show with very sparse view input uh, and these high capacity siren network representations underneath uh, last year in, in this paper. So compared to IDR, NERF, uh, other methods, you can also get away with a lot fewer uh, views simply because by baking in the surface as a part of the representation, um, it's just going to be more view consistent than, than a volume that is unconstrained at too many points if the views are too sparse. Now, in the last year or two, we've seen a lot of work on you know, using volume rendering together with surface-based representations, and those are very interesting lines of work, and that's probably the way to go. Um, OK, let's talk about the volume rendering just a little bit. Um, maybe you've heard of this. Maybe you've read some of these papers. Maybe you've written a few as well. The basic idea is, uh, is, is the following. We want to approximate a lot of integrals, one integral per uh, ray. So if we render a 3D scene, such as this drum set, we're gonna shoot rays for each pixel. And along each of these rays, we're gonna solve the volume rendering equation, which basically amounts to uh, computing a definite integral between two points, the near plane and the far plane. And the way this is implemented in most uh, systems today is, we're gonna just sample along this ray, take many, many, many samples, and then we're gonna approximate this integral. Well, now that is slow and it's mainly defined by how many times you sample. Every time you sample the function underneath, you have to evaluate uh, the MLP, the neural scene representation. And what that means is you have to run a full feed forward pass through the entire MLP every time you sample. And if you've worked on numerical integration in the past, then you probably know that you need many samples. So this becomes quickly very expensive. Uh, one idea and uh, that I'll, I'll just send, uh, send uh, tell you about is uh, that we had was the following. Well, most of machine learning is driven by automatic differentiation. It's this idea that you know you have your network representing something and you can use a really convenient and fast way to automatically calculate the gradients of that function. You need the gradients to optimize the parameters. so you know automatic differentiation to some extent is fairly simple, right? You use the chain rule, for example, in Autodiff, uh, or there are a few other types of rules that you could apply and automatic differentiation is easy. But wouldn't it be nice to also have something like an automatic integration framework where you, you, know, you don't have to do anything, you just train a network and automatically figures out the, the integral and uh, that way you could potentially uh, evaluate it quickly. Well, so the, in this comic that's from XKCD actually, uh, well, it turns out to be not as trivial. So automatic differentiation is simple or differentiation in, in general is simple. But as you may remember from your calculus classes, integration is actually really hard. There are so many different rules uh, and none of them actually are trivial to use for arbitrarily complicated functions because we don't really have any specific properties on these functions that we're representing. So it becomes very confusing and very difficult to write an automatic integration method. Um, but we set out to do something like that and I'll, I'll tell you how that works. But again, numerical integration techniques today either use things like Riemann sums, uh, quadrature rules, or Monte Carlo sampling. So these are the most commonly used techniques. They're all sampling-based techniques. So you just sample the function many times, and then you're trying to calculate the integral, which is the, the area under the curve, basically. OK, but there are a few uh, rules of calculus that we could use to our advantage and come up with clever ideas of how to integrate quickly. So the first one that uh, we were thinking about is the fundamental theorem of calculus, which basically just means that you can think about antiderivatives. So if the function that you're trying to integrate is called psi on the right here, on the top right, then uh, an undefined integral can be defined by its antiderivative phi, 
And if you have the antiderivative of the function, you can actually calculate uh, the uh, definite integral in a, in a, in an uh, integral in a, in an, uh, a range a to b by just two evaluations of this antiderivative. Okay, so most of you probably remember this from uh, calculus. This is the Newton Leibniz formula. If you have the antiderivative of the function, you can calculate arbitrary integrals between in the range a to b by just evaluating. Uh, uh, the this uh, antiderivative twice, and that would be a huge step from evaluating hundreds or thousands of times, uh, and give you potential benefits. Now, uh, how do we use that in a way to devise an automatic integration scheme? Well, we thought that uh, we could do the following, and you can. Uh, it's basically instead of specifying the network that represents the scene, we're going to just use an MLP architecture to represent the what we call the integral network. It's basically the antiderivative, okay? So we're gonna use an MLP to define the antiderivative, but we don't train this directly because we can't directly train the antiderivative. However, what you can do is you can use uh, automatic differentiation or other techniques to calculate the analytical derivative of this network, of this MLP, which, also, which is also an MLP. It just turns out to be a fairly complicated graph depending on what nonlinear activation functions you're using and, and other effects. But what you could do is write a little compiler, is what we did, take this integral network, compile it into in the grad network, psi, which is basically what we're then going to use to train. Okay, so just to make sure that everybody gets this, that the parameters of the integral network and the grad network are the same. They're not different. They're just rearranged in a different graph structure. So if you can automatically compile the integral network into a grad network, train that to represent your scene, your SDF or your radiance field or whatever you want, then what you could do is take the trained grad network, reassemble those weights into a slightly different structure. The parameters themselves don't change. And by definition, you get your integral network. Once you have the integral network, it's the antiderivative and you can evaluate that twice to calculate um, any definite integral you want. So this is a fairly simple idea, uh, and it turns out to work actually uh, fairly well for many functions. Uh, I'll show you how that works for neural radiance fields. So on the left is NERF, uh, then neural volumes, auto int. So we call this auto int for automatic integration, um, and it works pretty well. The speed ups are okay; they're not in the thousand to ten thousand fold, which is what we initially had hoped. Uh, and the problem is there is that uh, it actually turns out that volume rendering has two nested integrals, which makes it actually a little bit more challenging than we had initially thought. So you can use this auto end technique to solve any integral very fast. You just need to train the, the grad network once. But if you have a nest, nested integrals, it becomes a little bit more tricky. We can still apply the framework, but you don't get the same speed up benefits of just evaluating the network twice. Uh, so it was a really great idea. We presented this at CBPR last year and People thought it was very interesting. Okay, a couple of thoughts on neural rendering before I move on to the, the generative part. Um, for neural rendering, I think, you know, there are so many different choices, but the, the two that are most important seem to be computational efficiency. You just need to be able to render fast and you need to have good gradient flow back into the neural scene representation. And sometimes the challenge with uh, sphere tracing and SDF based representations is that well, if you don't hit the surface, then there's no gradient flow back into the underlying representation because you step along the ray, but you only really back propagate information into the representation when you hit a surface. And that becomes very challenging. Volume rendering is a lot more powerful because you back propagate information at every step, at every sample you take. So uh, SDF, uh, these sphere tracing based algorithms are kind of always require masks uh, around the objects and uh, they're kind of limited in other ways. So. I think volume rendering is really the way to go simply because it's, it's it allows for better gradient flow. And people have figured out how to use uh, volumetric representations together with volume rendering, and, but surface-based representations inside. So that, this, is, this is a really interesting development. Um, okay, the efficiency here is really linked to the time it takes to query the underlying representation. So that's a little bit counterintuitive because you know the speed of the neural rendering algorithm is mainly dependent on the speed of how, how fast it is to query the, the MLP that represents or whatever representation you have of the scene. So that is interesting, 
and it goes back to the neural scene representation. If we want to have a fast rendering algorithm, we have to have a fast representation. Um, and then the question is, okay, what's more important, perhaps the representation itself or the rendering? Well, it, from the NERF paper, it originally wasn't clear and it was suggesting that this implicit representation is the more important part. Uh, but what we've seen recently with, for example, Alex Yu's paper called Planoxels is that the rendering is really the key, the volume rendering. Uh, and what happens is that the volume rendering as devised by Nelson Max in 1995 is that if you use this physics-based rendering, it basically adds an inductive bias into your network pipeline that kind of forces the representation to learn something physically interpretable, including the depth map. Uh, and so you don't need to have an implicit representation. You can use a simple voxel grid, use that with uh, volume rendering, and you get something that uh, converges very fast uh, to a quality that's the same as NERF uh, with a larger memory footprint, perhaps. But uh, overall, you know, that motivates these uh, hybrid representations as well. Okay, so what are some of the open problems in this space? I mean, it's only been around for two years, but it's there's been a lot of action in this space. Lots of papers been uh, published. So, you know, typically people have said, oh, we need to uh, increase the training speed and the inference speed. Uh, and inference here is the same as rendering. Uh, once you have a pre-trained representation, we need to scale it to larger scenes. We need to work on the generalization and we need to be able to edit these uh, types of representations because that's what we can do with traditional representations already. Well, just recently, you know, a lot of developments have been done. For example, uh, maybe you've seen this block nerve paper that just came out a few weeks ago from Waymo and Berkeley. I mean, that is one of the interesting approaches for uh, thinking about large scale scenes. So we can use all this Waymo data and uh, fuse them into individual blocks, kind of inspired by Kilo nerve from Andreas Geiger's group again. Uh, but the basic idea is we, we have methods to represent very large scale scenes, entire city blocks already. And uh, NVIDIA released this paper called Instant uh, Neural Graphics Primitives, or I think it was recently advertised also as Instant NERF, uh, basically just a few seconds of training time. And that was enabled by a number of insights, for example, these custom CUDA kernels that, that the, the authors wrote, this hash table, and a couple of other ideas. It was a really great engineering effort to bring down the training time to just a few seconds. Uh, so lots of progress on this. And uh, I'll talk about these other two open challenges is the generalization and the editing part next. So what is generalization uh, and uh, generation is basically an, uh, the idea of using unstructured 2D data to uh, train a 3D uh, view consistent generative adversarial network. And I'm just trying to motivate our recent work on efficient geometry aware 3D uh, GANs here. That was a collaboration with NVIDIA and Stanford. And the basic idea is that we can use existing databases of 2D photographs to train 3D multi-view consistent models that generate people uh, that you can then render from multiple different views, as you can see on the left. But it also works for cats. Uh, we showed that it works in 360 degree settings for synthetic objects also, and for met faces and other data sets as well. So again, the, the question is this, if I want to use these neural scene representation together with a neural renderer, I need the renderer to supervise it with 2D data then, okay, what, what is the training data that I'm gonna to use to learn something about a function space? I'm gonna mainly focus on faces. So my function space is the, the space of all the faces. Well, I could use multi-view input data and uh, we can do that. There are data sets out there that provide multi-view consistent data from a camera rig of different people. For example, this triple ganger uh, data set, but it's really expensive and difficult to capture these multi-view consistent data sets. Uh, typically you have people, you don't even see the hair in this data, you just see the face really, uh, and you only have a limited number of people in these data sets. Uh, you can also use synthetic data, for example, uh, uh, the, the uh, face synthetics data set uh, from Microsoft, I believe. These are not photorealistic uh, 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 people, but you get ground truth depths, label segmentation, you get a fairly large variety of different people, more than 100,000 different types of people. Uh, so, so this is a really great starting point. But again, you're never gonna achieve photorealism with data sets like this because they are simply not photorealistic. The best thing if your goal is to learn photorealistic 3D uh, faces is to use 2D data that is fairly diverse and uh, that includes lots of different people from different perspectives with different facial poses and so on. Um, and the data set of choice that most people use for 2D GANs today are, is FFHQ, 
There's also setup A and other data sets, but FFHQ is a data set that is scraped from the internet, from Flickr, basically. There are 70,000 different people in there uh, and that different age range, different ethnicities, many different uh, types of uh, people. So this is what state-of-the-art 2D GANs are trained on. So we'd like to do the same thing, but it's not straightforward. So how does a, how does a GAN actually work? Um, well, a 2D GAN has a generator and a discriminator and they're jointly trained. The generator gets random noise as input and typically uses a CNN backbone to then generate a 2D image. Uh, it doesn't have to be a good 2D image, it just genera it maps noise to images, right? And the discriminator will then take this image as input. Uh, it's typically also a CNN architecture and it'll, it'll tell you if this image is real or fake. Uh, and so they're, they're jointly trained in a probabilistic framework that uh, eventually hopefully converges to something that generates photorealistic looking images by learning the distribution, right? We're not learning a single scene, we're learning a distribution of uh, images in this case. And that's what the power of a GAN really is. Now, if you want to train a 3D aware GAN uh, with 2D data, what you need to do is the same thing. You have a generator and a discriminator the generator maps random noise to a 3D scene. So instead of mapping it to a 2D image, you have somehow have to map it to a 3D scene. And then there's a discriminator that basically tells you for any view of this 3D representation, it uh, has to look like it came from the training set. It has to match the distribution, okay? Now, what is challenging about this? Well, there are a number of challenges. First of all, Training GAN takes a long time. Even something like Style GAN, which is the state-of-the-art 2D GAN, takes a week to train on a, on NVIDIA's cluster or so, right? So it, it's very it, it's very time-consuming. And the 2D GAN training doesn't involve any neural rendering. As I told you earlier, if you want to use volume rendering, for example, it takes a long time to render a single image. So now, let's say you want to do things train this 3D GAN, you have to render tens of millions of images in part as part of the process. So the computational efficiency of the neural rendering process and also the representation is the key of just being able to iterate through many, many, many different training examples, which is what you need to have the GAN converge in the first place. So conventional uh, volume rendering techniques and MLPs just simply won't work because they're too inefficient. You can't wait that long. I mean, think about even the carbon footprint that you're gonna induce with training the GAN once. So then again, the discriminator needs to operate on 2D images, not 3D data, because we want to train it on photorealistic 2D data collections. And typically we only have a single view per scene. We don't really have 2D uh, multi-view uh, data. And what that means really is that we have to have a fairly large batch size. We need to, we can't just render one image at a time and you know, have a mini batch size of one. We have to have a fairly large batch size and render many, many, many of these uh, of these batches. So it really boils down to the computational efficiency of how many times you can do that in a finite amount of time. And that was the focus of some of our recent work uh, that's coming out at CBPR uh, later this year, it's already online. Uh, and the key insight is that we developed a very efficient uh, and very simple um, neural scene representation. And we call it a triplane representation. It's actually stupidly simple. The idea is to use three planes that you put uh, on the X, Y, X, Z, and uh, Y, Z plane. So they are orthographic, orthogonal planes. And on these planes, uh, each, each pixel basically has a, has a feature vector, okay? So features on three 2D planes, very simple. Now, we want these three planes to represent a 3D scene. So we need to be able to query them anywhere in 3D. Uh, if we want to query them, we're gonna specify a position X, Y, Z. Uh, we're gonna project that position onto these three planes. We extract the feature vector from each of these planes and we aggregate it. Now, again, you could come up with fancy aggregation techniques. We just use the sum. It's probably the easiest way of aggregating these three features. Um, but then we feed this through an implicit decoder. So this is an example of a hybrid representation that I motivated earlier because the three planes themselves are an explicit grid of features, but not in 3D, but in 2D. Uh, but it's combined with a very, very small implicit decoder. So you have this implicit network on top that takes the uh, concatenated feature as input, 
and it outputs density and color. So it's the same volume representation as, as what NERV does, but just in a more efficient way. Okay, so the benefits of this triplane representation are that it's extremely memory efficient. Uh, first of all, because compared to a feature cube, like a volume, you only have to store three planes rather than the full volume. Uh, also, as you increase the resolution, the memory only scales quadratically rather than cubically. So it's very, very memory efficient. Uh, turns out that it works really well for generalization, which I'll uh, show you in a bit. Uh, and one of the other really great benefits is that we can combine it with 2D generators. So we don't need to develop 3D CNN based generators or other generators. We can just use a conventional 2D CNN generator like StyleGAN to generate the features on these planes. And I'll show you how that works in a second. First though, the question is, well, this seems so simple. Does it actually work in representing a 3D scene? Because you know the features at each 3D point are not really uniquely defined. Well, here's a direct comparison between MIPNERF on the left, that's a fully implicit representation and the triplane representation in a single scene overfitting scenario. So we just take you know, a, a few dozen photographs that here come from the tanks and temples data set. Uh, we fit a single representation representing the scene. It actually turns out that this triplane representation on the right gives us a sharper representation of this, uh, of this uh, sign. And uh, it has a lot of capacity. It, it's very expressive, even though it's more than eight times or almost eight times faster to query than the MIPNOF representation. Now, one thing I should say is that the triplane representation is not view dependent. So it cannot easily model view dependent effects, which is what MIPNERF and other nerf like representations can do. So in all the following examples, we basically just drop the view dependence uh, and, and use this triplane representation. Okay. But hopefully I convinced you by now that this really simple triplane representation can adequately and at high quality model 3D scenes. Okay, so here's the full architecture. It looks fairly complicated. So let me just walk you through it a little bit. Uh, there's the triplane representation together with the volume renderer. This is what I showed you just now for the single scene overfitting. As I mentioned before, we can actually generate the features on these three planes using a standard StyleGAN2 generator with very few modifications. And that's really the key because uh, people spend a lot of time optimizing these types of generator architectures. So why not just leverage them? You can't easily do that if you have a volumetric representation. It actually turns out we use the StyleGAN2 discriminator as well, uh, or at least a slightly modified way, a variant of it. Uh, so we can directly build on top of that. One thing I haven't talked about is the super resolution uh, module. So even though we have a fairly efficient 3D representation and rendering technique, it's still limited to something on the order of 128 by 128 images. So we need to do a little bit of upsampling after to get it up to resolutions of 512 by 512, which is what we're targeting here. Uh, we're conditioning both the generator and the discriminator using the camera pose, which turned out to be key, as I'll show you in the, in the following. Now, I said that we're using a standard discriminator. Uh, it's only partly true. So a standard discriminator would take a real image from your training data set and a generated image uh, such as shown here, it sends it through a layer, a few convolutional layers, and then decides whether that's real or fake. Uh, one thing we did is we slightly modified this architecture into what we call the dual discrimination. So we also take a training and a generated image, but we take it at two different scales. And we take it at one scale is the highest, uh, highest scale, the 512 by 512 resolution. The other one is the lower resolution scale, uh, which is basically the raw output of the neural rendering. And the reason why we do that is we want both the raw data coming out of the neural renderer and also the upsampled image to be both realistic and both consistent. Uh, so otherwise we get a lot of uh, potentially artifacts from the super resolution. So here's a, a generated person at the raw resolution from the neural renderer before, and here's the super resolved uh, image. So you get guarantees of multi-view consistency for the raw neural rendering uh, for the super resolution, you don't necessarily, but it works really well in practice. There's only minor amount of aliasing. I should say we use StyleGAN2 for the generator uh, discriminator, and it's known that there is some aliasing in there, which is what the folks at NVIDIA have already fixed with StyleGAN3. Uh, but uh, again, ours is fully based on StyleGAN2, so we inherit the aliasing problems. I briefly mentioned that we use pose conditioning. What that means is we need to make the generator and the discriminator aware of the camera pose. 
you don't do that, as we see on the left, you get uh, multi-view inconsistencies with these expressions and uh, artifacts. I mean, it's not completely artifact free on the right. You can see some aliasing again on the lower teeth, but overall looks fairly view consistent. And here are just a couple of results. This is a generated person again at the resolution 512 by 512. You can get the depth map for free, right? It comes for free. It's not supervised. Uh, it just is it part of the intermediate representation. One thing you may notice is that the, the eyes are usually hollow and that comes from the fact that in the data set, all people always look at the camera. So there's never a var variation in the viewing directions. Uh, it creates this hollow, hollow eye illusion or hollow face illusion where in order to create eyes that always look at the camera, I mean, because we're learning the, the distribution of the training data, it has to create these hollow eyes, which is a little bit creepy, but hopefully we can alleviate that in the future. We can generate these cats. They look photorealistic. Right, and the shapes come out as well for free, basically, without any 3D supervision. Okay, just a comparison to some previous work, Giraffe won the best paper award, I think last year at ICV, lifting style again, a couple of other really interesting techniques. They're just not as view consistent because you get these identity shifts, uh, pr primarily because the intermediate depth representation isn't as, as good as uh, ours. Pygen was perhaps the previous state of the art, from last year, it's actually our paper as well. And if you see how far we've come in just one year, I mean, we're able to render PyGAN at one frames per second and with an FID score of almost 30. With EG3D, we're up to 35 frames per second rendering time with an FID score of 4.7. Uh, and what that means is that the FID score gives you something like how, how what's the quality of the data? It's almost it as StyleGAN2. StyleGAN2 is a little bit better, uh, but it's almost as good. So here, here's this uh, video clip that I showed you before already. It, it's basically doing a latent code interpolation between these uh, people. And you can see that you can not only... Oh. Oh, stuck. You can not only get these uh, nice looking interpolations that are multi-view consistent, but it also inherently interpolates in this latent space in the shape, right? The shapes again are not perfect, but uh, they act as a scaffold basically for generating the radiance field on top. As I, as I was mentioning, all of this runs in real time at more than 30 frames per second on a decent GPU, uh, which is what you can hopefully see here in our little preview program. I'm having some trouble with my videos here. Yeah runs in real time. So the code will be available soon. Uh, it's going through an internal review at NVIDIA right now. And one you know, application that this will enable soon is also then not just thinking about generating people, but also using the GAN as a prior. So for example, if you take a photograph of a real person, here's one of our co-authors, and you, you fit the GAN to it using GAN inversion techniques, you can actually use a single photograph and fit a multi-view consistent 3D representation to that person and it looks fairly good within, a, I would say, a limited range of camera motions. So this whole set of you know, GAN inversion techniques for 2D now applies to 3D too. Uh, as soon as we have a pre-trained 3D GAN acts as a strong prior, we can solve lots of very challenging problems. And just as a departing thought, I, I wanna advertise some of our recent work on 3D GAN inversion. And we picked one application, which is very challenging to do otherwise, which is, to animate a single portrait image. For example, let's say you have a single image of this actor here. You can use standard GAN editing techniques and GAN inversion techniques to edit attributes like age, you know, facial hair, hair, gender, add glasses, things like that. These are really fun techniques and lots of papers have been written about this. But can we put it together with the techniques uh, like uh, facial reenactment, uh, things that Matthias, for example, has done some pioneering work on in this face-to-face -face paper and many others. Like, can we actually animate these people uh, just from a single image? Well, it seems impossible, but using this GAN inversion technique, we can fit a pre-trained 3D GAN to the source image and then start to transfer the facial expressions to these actors and actually animate not only the the source image, but all these attribute edited images. 
So this really enables new directions for, uh, for editing, thinking about making some of these GAN-based techniques also not just photorealistic and use them for rendering, but also for starting to animate and edit uh, content. So that brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, I, I told you a little bit about neural scene representation, rendering and generation is actually only one aspect of the things we work on in the lab, work on a number of different computational imaging and display techniques and VR, AR, also microscopy. So if you're interested, you can visit our website. I uh, just wanted to thank my co-authors. These are all the co-authors for the EG3D paper, in particular Eric Chan, uh, Connor Lin, Matthew Chan, and Koki. Uh, they're the four first authors of the paper and they really did a tremendous job along with all the other NVIDIA and Stanford authors. And then I wanted to thank all of my group members, current and former, who drove this research I presented to you today, specifically Vincent Zitzman and Eric, uh, but also all the others who have contributed in major ways to all the work I, I showed today. So thanks again for inviting me, and uh, that was a great opportunity. Cool. Thanks a lot for the awesome talk. Um, yeah, so much great stuff, actually. Really impressive results, especially on the, I mean, the few consistent geometry is pretty impressive, I think. That, that is really amazing uh, what you can get right now. Okay. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, I mean, you can just unmute yourself. You don't, you don't have to raise your hand. Uh, hey, thank you so much for the nice talk. So I have one question regarding the last part when you are uh, generating the scenes based on the representation. And also it, it's related to the representation itself. So let's say in a scene, if there are multiple objects, so do you learn the representation, joint representation, or can you learn the independent representation so that you can move the objects within the scene or something like that ah great question so how do let me rephrase the question can you only learn this gan on on a single object or can you maybe also start thinking about more complicated scenes right and move these objects around maybe composite them or maybe even learn entire scenes is that the question yeah 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 probably i could not frame it yeah, right. yeah no that's yeah, good that's... yeah it's a fantastic question so i think one thing you can do is if if you actually have the depth you can composite objects. You can generate different objects. You can apply any, any transformation you want on them. And because you have the depth map, you can actually composite them because mm -hmm. you can uh, get these occlusions for free. Now, one thing I should say is that in most of these cases, uh, right? If you, for example, look at the person here is uh, the background is kind of like a plane on the side. So we'd have to figure out how to cut off the background uh, on the side because otherwise that's gonna be uh, annoying. The background mm -hmm. is there because the range of viewing angles from the FFHQ training set is sort of limited. Uh, if you had something that is more 360 degree on, on persons, that, that wouldn't really be there. But so in principle, you can composite, the, composite these objects. If you start thinking about generating entire scenes, that becomes a lot more complicated. I think that's even an open challenge for 2D GANs, not even speaking of these 3D GANs. Mm -hmm. But you can use individual people. You can start animating them. You can composite them. I think that's possible with some modifications now or in the near future. Uh, generating and generalizing over entire complicated scenes, I think, is a big open challenge. OK, I see. Uh, but for that, you probably need the depth information, right? That's the constraint, right? To composite objects, you need depth information. Otherwise, you don't know which object is in front of yeah. each object. Yeah, true, true. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay. There's actually a few questions on, uh, on, on YouTube. Um, do you think the volumetric rendering prior can also help for, for image understanding, like classification? Oh, excellent question. Yeah. Um, we have worked on scene representations in the past. And one of the big insights was in one of Vincent's papers was that even if you train a neural scene representation in a generalized setting on a class of objects like faces or chairs or something like that, it inherently learns a feature-based representation that lives in 3D. And one thing that Vincent was able to show was that these features can easily be classified also as parts. So for example, we had this uh, experiment on PartNet where we then retrained, we trained the general a generalized representation of all these different chairs or objects first. We fixed those. We trained a very simple linear classifier on top of the features that would start classifying these parts. And actually turns out to be working really well. And what that means is that 
the neural rendering and generalization technique itself already inherently learns features that are in some disentangled space that happen to correspond to semantic uh, 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 meaning as well. And you still need, I mean, it's an abstract feature-based representation, so you still need to train a classifier on top of it, but it is in principle possible. And I think that's also like another really great direction for future work. I'm actually surprised that there hasn't been a lot of papers like this already because it seems- Exactly, because so I mean, that's really what you want is you want to be able to not just represent the scene visually, but you want to understand it. And I think, you know, classification, semantic segmentation, things like that, things that uh, Matthias and Angela have worked on for many years, uh, they can fit in this framework really well. And I think that's, seems like a low hanging fruit to think about. Actually, funny. I guess you know these like multitask learning papers in 2D, right? Where people add like depth constraints and normal constraints and stuff like this. And in principle, this is just the next level of it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and what, but what I'm saying is, you, you can add that supervision if you have the training data. But then you need train, training data sets that have both visual information and semantic labels. But what's even more powerful is that even by training them on just visual data, they inherently seem to learn already something that is semantically disentangled. And that that is even more powerful because that leads to semi-supervised learning strategies where you train on one modality and you can almost almost easily transfer it over to a different modality. It's almost more powerful even because you can tap into whatever source of data is more widely available for the task at hand. Yeah, any, any other questions here? I guess Angie, you had one, right? I can ask a question in case other people are afraid. I thought um, because uh, I mean, the stuff that you're doing is super cool um, and definitely relevant to the um, visual side of a lot of what we're taking a look at in terms of geometry, semantics, and whatnot. I think you also mentioned some stuff about compositionality in, in scenes, but I'm wondering, there's like also another natural direction towards dynamic scene representations. Um, whether you think we have enough with the operators and representations that we have to extend efficiently to represent um, dynamic deformable objects as, as well uh, in terms of being able to do the, the same in terms of getting a representation of the geometric structure um, view synthesis or whether there's more that needs to be done there in order to capture this extra dimensionality. Yeah, excellent question again. Uh, do How do we apply all of this to dynamic scenes, right? Uh, so there has been quite a bit of work on deformable objects, let's say, uh, papers like Nerfies and HyperNerf and other types of uh, papers basically looked at, okay, what if you have pictures of the same object with slightly different facial expressions, for example, you know, if you can map them all back to some canonical representation, I think that can be something that, that, that these types of papers have already handled. We've also seen some fairly impressive work on dynamic scenes that are, for example, uh, inferred from cell phone videos. Uh, and you know, you take a video with the camera motion or scene motion, and it turns out that you can propagate some of the information seen in one frame to a different viewpoint on a different frame. And uh, these are natural things to explore at, to get space-time consistent uh, you know, neural radiance fields. Uh, I'm not sure if, I think this is still a really great open direction of looking at complicated scenes and how they uh, how they deform over time. Deformable objects is one thing, but uh, dynamic scenes with complicated motions is a different challenge. I think their compositionality is one uh, aspect that needs to be solved, but the dynamics are a different challenge. I, I think there's still this is a great direction for future research, and we've seen the first steps towards that. But I think there's still a lot to be done. And also, you know, the question is then always: Are we going to use only these neural network-based representations? How much of the existing graphics pipeline or vision pipeline can we bake into that? Just like NERF used volume rendering, and that added a very strong inductive bias on uh, letting us learn meaningful things. I think. Similarly, for animations, we can start thinking about, well, how can we use the existing pipeline or the existing tool set in a meaningful way? For example, when we do things like faces, how do we leverage 3D morphable models? Or when we think about bodies, we have skeletons, but when we go to arbitrary objects, we, we just don't have those necessarily. So, you know, it's, it's always easiest to start with specific types of objects because we know a lot about them and we can, uh, 
easily label them. We can fit skeletons and things like that. We have baseline uh, methods that reviewers always want to, want to see or comparisons. But if we go to arbitrarily complex scenes, it, it gets fairly challenging quickly, yeah. Okay, actually, we have, we have a lot of questions still on YouTube. <laughs> I'm trying to go through a few of them. So uh, one of them are interesting. So what do you think about the, the capacity of, of neural representations in terms of adding new dimensions, like um, like lighting, for instance, interpolating like positions of light, intensity, color interpolation, and stuff like that? Oh, absolutely. That's so important. I mean, uh, many people are working on that. That's the obvious thing to do next is like, okay, we, ha we, ha we have a radiance field. The radiance field is this 5D function. It basically just models the same scene in a static setting under fixed lighting conditions. So, you know, Angela talked about dynamics already, you know, dynamic lighting is obviously a different thing, uh, deformation, uh, material properties, we want to disentangle all of them so that we can re-render them. We want to be able to eventually do all the things we can already do with the traditional 3D computer graphics and vision tool set with these neural representations. And we're not quite there yet. So I think, the two are complementary approaches that have different benefits and advantages. And we still have to catch up with like decades worth of research in the computer graphics community to get to that point. But we're seeing so much quick progress in, in this neural rendering community, which is so exciting. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, relighting uh, is one of many aspects that we need to figure out. And, and I've seen some work already. There, there are a number of papers out there, uh, but uh, this is one of the important directions also. I have another slightly maybe provocative thing. So if, if you if you're thinking about neural rendering, how it started, right? It basically was like, okay, we we have stuff that we know from graphics, we know how rendering works, and now we're going to replace certain pipelines with neural networks, right? I mean, you can use the GAN to render something, you can use yeah. additional GAN to render something, um, and the question, like a lot of people have been saying when NERF came out, well, it's more like a, a reconstruction method rather than a learning method, right? Because it, there's technically no learning. So do you think eventually we're going to converge back to just using like neural rendering more for the reconstruction task and then go back to graphics or representation for actual rendering? Or do you think more, well, we're going to have like neural renderings finally embedded in actual hardware um, and you're going to use this in end, in, 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 in end user applications like Ansys or? Okay, so I think that it's, it's an interesting question, right? Like, I mean, what's even learning and what's not learning? I mean, I would say, let me just classify all this neural rendering. I mean, neural rendering is a, is a hype word, I would say, right? Like what, we have differentiable rendering systems. We have ranging from simple rendering techniques like sphere tracing and volume rendering, but people like Wenzel Jakob and others work on path tracing and ray tracing and making all of that differentiable in others, obviously too. Uh, so I think, there is a push in the computer graphics community to just make everything differentiable. And the, the benefit of that is that you can now have the rendering be part of an inverse rendering framework where you can take images and, and back propagate into these, all these material lighting shape properties. And so I would say that's a push from the graphics community. Uh, but that being said, the graphics community is also scattered across all these different fields, right? So I think it becomes a true learning challenge when you can start generalizing across different objects. And, and I think this, again, is only one way of doing that. There are many different other techniques to generalize across different objects or scenes to learn something about distributions of functions. And I think that's really the AI part of it. That being said, I mean, we use neural networks to represent these scenes. So it is, we're learning those networks, but through optimization and backpropagation, obviously, but uh, there is a lot of work on neural network architecture design and, and things like that. So, you know, it, it, it's hard to draw the boundary between computer graphics, computer vision and, and, and AI at the stage. Uh, and everybody probably has a different understanding of what each of these fields constitutes. I'm just glad that people from these different communities get together and try to use the best set of techniques from all these different fields to really enable new things because, you know, I would say 3D computer gra graphics and 3D computer vision have become maybe a little bit more incremental over the last couple of years. And this just gives us a new push towards different directions and we can do things we couldn't do before. So, you know, that's what makes it exciting, I would say. Yeah, I agree. Probably the most exciting field right now. I don't know, so much cool progress. I mean, if you're going back like three or four years where we started and, and, and now what, what is possible even at real-time rates, I think that's quite impressive actually. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Maybe one last question. Um, 
actually, I would have fun if I can. Uh, so I think it's going back to uh, topics before. So with the different modalities. And, and there I was wondering if you could use some sort of coarse geometry for, for uh, initializing the implicit representations where, for example, you don't have full coverage of a, of a scene. So I, I guess it doesn't really make sense for fa faces, but if you would like to use it for complete scenes and you don't have all the images necessary for the uh, optimization of the implicit field, but you still would like to query those areas. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So any any you know physics based or uh, representation is good, I would say. So maybe starting from faces, you said faces not, but I mean there, there's been a lot of work on three D morphable models, and then combining that with just learning the part that you need to learn, but modeling the part that you can model. Right. So I think the Matthias had a had a fairly early on paper in this uh, space, uh, neural textures. Right. It's like we can model the shape of a face fairly well with these 3D morphable models. It's just the appearance that really changes and maybe then also the hair and so on and so forth. But why not just use existing techniques for what they do well, for example, model the shape of the face and then just learn the rest. And that actually resulted in very convincing results, right? In the in more general settings, there have been approaches that combine for example, Vlad and Kultrun's group had this uh, had had this series of two papers. I think stable view synthesis uh, is one of them, where they use call map or structure from motion to reconstruct the 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 point cloud and the camera poses from real data. Then they use multi view stereo to basically give you a mesh. It's not a very good mesh, but it acts as a scaffold. To, and now you can uh, use feature extraction from the images, project these features onto the scaffold, and then do some feature aggregation and decoding uh, on top of the surface. And that actually worked really well uh, because it, in, it in, introduces an inductive bias uh, into the network again that helps you prune down the space of possible solutions and it just works more robustly with fewer views and uh, they get some really great results. So using information where you have it, for example, from traditional methods like multi-view stereo structure for motion is all, I think is always useful. And for real data, the thing is, you know, what people don't talk about is if you work with real data, you need the camera poses, right? Like there's very little work on jointly optimizing camera poses and you'll see representations. And why should there be? Because existing methods work very well uh, in many cases, at least. So if you need to run call map anyways on your data to get the camera poses, you already have a scaffold of the scene. So why not use it? <laughs> I mean, it is a... It is a Thing that's there anyways, and it's part of the pipeline already. Yeah, it, it really makes sense. Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> cool. So thanks a lot. Um, I think unfortunately we're already a little bit over time. Um, we also don't want to want to stress your schedule too much. I mean, typically we would take you out for dinner now and have have a few beers. But <laughs> I think that might be difficult for now. Um, but hopefully we can still uh, catch up in person actually in the summer when the conferences are actually hopefully happening. Um, sure. So. Yeah, with that, really thanks a lot for, for giving this amazing talk and, and, and showing this, this really, really nice work. I think there's a lot of, a lot of cool things to follow up and, and hopefully, especially for the PhD students, they, um, they have generated a couple of cool ideas for their own work. So yeah, Fantastic. thanks a lot. Thanks for having me and uh, all the best. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. <laughs>